I would love to actually welcome two highly intelligent, highly specialized and completely underrated, underrecognized women. I have Dr. Linda Ogallo and Dr. Maslin Gudoshava. Ladies, welcome to Double O Direct. Thank you, Thank Olivia. Thank you, Olivia. <laughs> <laughs> <Maslin>. <laughs> so Linda, tell me a little bit about yourself and the work you do at ICPAC. Um, yeah, like you've mentioned, my name is Linda Ogallo. I'm a climate change adaptation expert at IGAT Climate Prediction and Application Center. Um, I began this journey, actually, there's, I'm an Oprah fan. Wait, so, Oprah Winfrey or Oprah, Oprah Winfrey. like Winfrey? Oprah Winfrey. Oprah Winfrey. Okay. I, I think I grew up on Oprah Winfrey and, I, and there's one thing she actually said that... Let's pause. You get a car. You, you. <laughs> Remember, we did a show where you get a car. You, you. Oh, no, but seriously, tell me. Yes, in campus, I used to run away from, leave campus early just to go watch Oprah. And you still got but, a PhD. Yes, I Damn. did. <laughs> but there's one thing that she said that made me actually feel better about my journey. And she's talking about uh, the difference between purpose, people, because there are people probably like you who always knew when I grew up, I want to be a radio presenter. I and actually wanted to be an astrophysicist, but we're going to circle back to that another time. <laughs> Continue. So because my journey has not always been direct. Yeah. So I began um, in chemistry. I got my first two degrees in chemistry. And I think I... We cannot be friends. <laughs> you know why? Why? Chemistry was my worst subject. <laughs> Had the hottest teacher. Maybe that's why it was my worst subject, but we're going to circle back to that. Continue. Your first do undergrad master's chemistry. And yes. Then? And so I did it because it was easy. Ah, and no, Mumbi. <laughs> Mumbi, please get this woman out. <laughs> okay, continue. So I did. So for my master's, I remember I was really good at chemistry. It came very easy for me. But my supervisor... Um, I was in North Carolina State University at the time. Yes. So he kept on testing me. So it, by the time I realized it was like two years of an endless test. So he kept on giving me harder problems. So when I fix it, then he gives me the second year of problem. I fix it the third year. So by then I was so stressed. I was like, I don't want to do this anymore. I was traumatized. So I decided um, leaving chemistry and moving back to Nairobi. I had a full scholarship to do my PhD. In fact, my dad got me a round trip ticket. Because he didn't believe I was actually coming back home. To stay. To stay. Yeah. So I was like, no, daddy, I'm coming home. Yes. So at the time, I thought, I'm coming back home to mentor women. So I came home. <laughs> yeah, in fact, it's interesting that you have Kobash <laughs> in the hood. Because I joined uh, K-Crew at the time wait, in wait, 2007. Wait, wait, wait. You have a master's in chemistry and you joined yes. K-Crew? Yes. Because I wanted a, to what? mentor women. I was just supporting them okay. on the background. Yeah. And they used to go to schools. I wanted to learn how to enter schools so I can start working with young girls because I was, I was going to change. I was coming back to change the world. I, st I was still young and naive. I thought I could change the world. Mumbi, <laughs> she was young. She was naive. <laughs> but she had a master's in chemistry and a full scholarship for her PhD. Okay, let's continue. So still trying to figure out what I wanted to do. So I'm second generation climate scientist. My Your dad... Father, Scientist? My dad was a climate scientist, yes. Okay. Um, he was the founding director of ICPAC, actually, Get Climate Prediction Application Center. This makes so much. <laughs> you see how that whole chemistry, you see my mom, yeah, she was, she's in finance. Yeah, she's a financial attache. It explains everything. That's why I have no idea about chemistry or money, actually. Okay, we're going to circle back. So he founded ICPAC, yes. founding director. He was a founding director. Yes. Okay. So he it started as a project. He was a WMO at the time in Switzerland. What's so he, WMO? World Meteorological Organization. Okay. So it's a global um, UN organization that deals with climate and weather. I thought they were just wizards. They would just do magic and then <laughs> hope for the best when they, when they came on screen. But actually, there's a whole department at the UN. Good to know, WMO. Yes. Yeah, so they he moved to back to Nairobi, set out set up the drought monitoring center, and then worked with the executive secretary of IGAD at the time. Uh, with support from the Kenyan government and uh, and the rest of the region, they established uh, ICPAC. So you have this master's. You're not going into ICPAC. You're working for K-Crew, mentoring women. Yes. Okay, we're going to pause there because we need to just digest all of that. Oh, yeah? and I was a musician too. <laughs> So you're also a musician. Are you also a musician? No. Okay, I think it was Jonah from Art Ride. So I'm going to have you two. We're going to set up the mics. We'll have a jam session here. I'm going to...
<laughs> yeah, all right. So, Dr. Masalin <laughs> Gudoshava, you are not Kenyan. What brought you to Kenya? Um, so, what brought me to Kenya was my passion for providing climate services to people. So, providing people with climate information that they can use in making their decision making. I love that. Give me some background on your home country and your journey there uh, and how you ended up becoming a climate scientist. Okay, so for me, I think like Linda, I wasn't really sure of what I wanted to do. So in my undergrad and my master's, I did applied mathematics. Yes. Yeah. And I guess it was the same for her. I took that because I think applied mathematics is really easy. I love how pure Once. scientists, <laughs> when they're talking about their science, they look at, let's say, social scientists like we're idiots. You know, I, I love it. I love it. They look at us like, I did applied mathematics. Don't ask me because it's going to get too technical. You ain't going to understand. But okay. Okay. So you went into applied mathematics. Uh -huh. Where were you studying? Uh, I was studying at the National University of Science and Technology in, in Zimbabwe. In Zimbabwe. Okay. Yes. Great. Great. Yes. So, so then how did you make the transition from that into climate science? And what did you study at PhD level? Okay, so my transition was two ways. So the first time it was more of when we were in a math class and we're doing dynamical systems and something that just caught my mind. Our professor talked about uh, the butterfly effect. I love that. <laughs> yeah, I could throw like a piece of rice somewhere and then there's like a hurricane in another country. Okay. Yeah. Yes. And, so. But I know that from the movie. It's called the butterfly effect. It's like a climate action for, for, for dummies. Continue. Yes. Yeah. So from that, I was like, oh, that sounds really interesting. Maybe I could pursue that. But then after my master's, I was like, oh, I think I'm a really bit tired. I need to work for some time. The, the job that I got, it was lecturing and it was a little bit close to my village. So I used to visit my village a lot. Then I realized one thing is like people grow and then there's no rain, right? Yes. And then I'm like, well, if people had information on f what could happen next, people would probably plan better and then maybe they could shift the way that they are doing things. Yes. And then... That's when I applied for a fellowship and I got a Fulbright fellowship in the US and then I started. For those who didn't hear, she said she got a Fulbright fellowship in the US and it is a big deal. Continue. <laughs> yes. So I went there and did climate science at North Carolina State University. Is that where you met uh, <laughs> the lovely Dr. Linda Ogallo? <laughs> or is, is, is it an institution known for climate science, North Carolina? No, because I, I went to North Carolina Be honest, because tell the truth. my dad's best friend, uh -huh. they're encompassed together. Is he from Zimbabwe? No, okay, he's, he's from Uganda. He's from Uganda. <laughs> and he was and her professor. Yes, yes so was we were not there at the same time. <laughs> but I went to North Carolina because that's the only place my daddy would let me go because his best friend was there. Yeah. But yeah, we both have NC State you're background. Both extremely intelligent women. You're pure scientists. Um, you're women in STEM. Was there any sort of point in your education or in your career selection that you felt unheard or disadvantaged as a woman studying science? Because you seem to have very supportive family members, a very supportive community, and yet this doesn't ring out as, you're going to make a lot of money doing this, I think, or when are you ever going to have X, Y, Z? I don't understand from your perspective, looking back, were there any of those challenges? Uh, I think for me, um, uh, the coming into climate change I think even climate change adaptation was not because of my dad, actually. It was because of my uncle. And during that period when I was trying to discover myself, figure out what I want to do, I, I benefited from my dad being the director of ICPAC and having short, short courses. Anytime they'd have a short course around, I'd, I'd sit in and listen. And there's a course that they did on indigenous knowledge and climate change. And they worked with um, the rainmakers in the Nganyu community and the farmers in Western Kenya, the Maasai community, and just beginning to see how these people had indigenous knowledge and how they were working with scientists and coming together and, and generating what they were calling at the time and what's become co-production. And I said, this is what I want to do. So getting into the climate space with my dad is one of the scientists, was one of the scientists that got a Nobel Prize with Al Gore. 
So he What? He basic in this space he's a big deal. Yes. So coming into a space even after he retired I joined Dick Park after he retired yes. and having to having being his daughter was a bigger thing to overcome than being a woman. Okay. Because everybody assumes you're there because of yeah. you know your links. So yeah. yes. So yeah. it almost felt like I had to prove myself mm -hmm. in terms of I'm not just professor's daughter mm -hmm. i am me on my own right yes. so that has been i think a bigger hurdle for me than i feel like i don't think and and back to the difference between my journey in chemistry and my journey with my dad because um I, the benefit of having someone who's been in the field was having someone who could hold my hand and let me know what is hard and what is not hard let me know this is normal as opposed to when i started the first time i didn't have someone to give me a normal and tell me no 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 this guy is kind of giving you something that you're not supposed to be able to do at this level yes and i didn't have someone to navigate that for me and i always wonder going back if i had a mentor for my chemistry degree if I would have gone on with it but because I had my dad to kind of walk me through he was my first supervisor he he kind of talked me through encouraged me when I felt um kind of uh felt like I wasn't sure of myself because I was stepping into big shoes he'd always tell me Linda you're doing a good job so that was coming into my own in a field where my daddy is a giant was a bigger story Hurdle. sort of yeah to overcome what about you maslin what uh challenges if any did you encounter as a woman in stem wanting to be a climate expert um so i think for my family they are very supportive i think they always say chase your dream uh whatever you want to do will always support you i think uh, one of the things uh, that was really a challenge was coming from a mathematics background and then venturing into climate science for a PhD. It was sort of a step learning curve and then being also in a new environment, trying to make friends in a new environment where you don't have any relatives. But the one thing that I learned from there is that the people around you are your support team. So there were quite a number of working in teams and everything and people encouraging me and all, yeah. I continue my conversation with the two sensational, phenomenal, uber-intelligent women, Dr. Linda Ogalo and Dr. Maslin Gudasava. This is a conversation on climate change. We're talking about finance, food security, and personal security, and they are from ICPAC. So let's first unpack what ICPAC is. Linda. Yeah, so IGAD, ICPAC is a specialized institution of IGAD Climate Prediction Application Center. So we're a climate specialized institution. IGAD began in 1986. What does IGAD stand for? Intergovernmental Authority on Development. So it began in 1986 um, under the late President Moy and the heads of state at the time as a drought monitoring center. It has then grown into one of the African Union's uh, RECs regional economic bodies for the region. And one of the areas that IGAD is actually known for is in peace and security. So uh, I talked about how my dad started the drought monitoring center and then the drought monitoring center then became, became ICPAC and has since grown since then um, to an organization that provides climate and climate services for not just the IGAD countries that are eight, but ICPAC has the additional East Africa community countries, Burundi, um, Tanzania, and Rwanda. So ICPAC covers climate services for 11 countries, while IGAD has eight countries within the Greater Horn of Africa. Wonderful. Uh, Maslin, tell me a little bit about uh, the departments within ICPAC. Okay, so the departments within ICPAC, we have like uh, the climate services that she has talked about. And then in terms of climate services, we provide forecasts at weekly, uh, monthly, and then also seasonal. And then in that, we also have what is called the Greater Horn of Africa Climate Outlook Forum, which happens like three times a year, one in February, the other one in May, and then the other one in August. And then we also do climate, we also do environmental monitoring. And then there's a division that focuses on food security. Uh, we also have climate change uh, division. And then recently there's also the disaster operating center where we are monitoring the disasters that are 
happening over the region 24 hours. I just want to get an understanding of um, where we are with regards to climate change, drought, and food security in a general sense. From your experience as a climate expert, um, we've all heard that we're suffering severe drought, the worst in the last 40 years. Uh, how dire is the situation and what can you tell us in relation to the work that ICPAC does? Uh, when we talk about climate change and the Horn of Africa generally, um, usually Marceline and team look at the climate data because for the region and, and if you're from Kenya, you know that our rainfall comes in seasons. So we have the long rains in March, April, May for most of the country. And then we have the short rains in October, November, December. And then most of our farmers rely on rainfall to know when to plant, what to plant. And so what has been happening for five consecutive seasons is the rains have not been enough. And so when we talk about climate change generally, uh, which is usually the difference between my department and hers, we look at what has been the difference over 30 years. Uh, while they talk about forecasting, they look at short term, one week, one month, three months. So when the policy side of climate change, we look at, so for communities that have been living a certain way for historically for generations, the climate is changing in such a rapid way that what they used to be used to, what they used to provide for, the land that they used to rely on is no longer viable. And the context is not just that we are experiencing five failed rainfall seasons. There was a pandemic before that that had an impact on the economy. And before that, there was flooding. Before that, there was desert locusts. There were cyclones. So it's it's. Um, not just a matter of the climate is changing because for us, what we, what we talk about when it comes to climate change is either too much water or too little water. But what makes it dire for local communities is the capacity to adapt. So what is the economic situation? So if you have a small piece of land and you're able to grow enough to take you for three months and the rains don't come, and then the next season the rains don't come again, what does that mean for you in terms of your economic decisions? Where does it put families? And people are beginning to get to a point in some parts of the country of, of famine or people are dying. So it's making people feel a bit more desperate and it's causing them to react in different ways. So what we're trying to say, what we're trying to do is understand where these impacts are high or where the areas that are hard hit and how can we help communities one, understand that their climate has changed and then live with the changing clim climate. And then how can we help us develop in a way that we're not bringing more harm to the environment? In a nutshell, IGAD, especially ICPAC, is focused on adaptation rather than prevention or halting the change because the change is happening. Yes. So the focus for ICPAC is to say this is happening. Let's let people know this is happening and let's let them adapt as quickly and as properly as they can in order to survive. Yes, because in Africa, as a whole continent, our contribution to global emissions is about less than 4%. Yes. As Eastern Africa, it's less than 1%. It's 1% 1 or less. You come to Kenya, it's as a middle-income company, probably country, probably more than others. But if we all as Africa stopped polluting completely, it will just be 3%. It wouldn't make much of a difference. Yeah. To Linda and Maslin, Magdalene Maluta, welcome to Double O Direct. Thank you, Olivia. I'm honored to be on this show. My name is Magdalene Maluta. I am an engineer at Arkwright Kenya Limited. We assemble, we design, assemble, and sell electric vehicles. I have a diploma in mechanical engineering, which is from NEC, and I did it at National Industrial Training Authority. And NEC is a widely recognized diploma. I know, like when I said I didn't, hadn't heard of NEC, Magdalene was so offended. She's like, what do you mean? What do you mean? Do you know what this piece of paper can get me? What doors it can open? <laughs> no, seriously, lovely to have you here. Lovely to have the representation of your electric vehicles. I see you have a motorbike and an e-bike and I'm loving them. We're going to be demonstrating them shortly. But back to you, uh, Maslin, and your modeling and your prediction of climate in order to assist actually it's short term isn't it it's daily and weekly or a couple of weeks ahead uh so we do forecasting for weekly 
monthly and then seasonal time yes. scales. Yes. What are the greatest changes that you've noticed over the last few years with regards to historical data that you've been uh, having access to? Okay, so in terms of that, we can look at uh, temperature. So we can see that in temperature has been really warming up. And to record, I think 2016 has been one of the warmest years. So we can see that temperature has been increasing over Kenya and over most parts of Africa. And then in terms of uh, extremes, so in, when I say extremes, I mean in terms of number of flooding events, drought events, we can see that there's quite an increase in terms of those extreme events. Why is it so important to forecast? Uh, so forecasting is important to enable people to make decisions, right? So you want to know what will happen in the future so that you know what to do. So for example, a simple one, though we don't do daily forecasting, is like, should you carry a sweater or should you not carry a sweater, right? And then with what we normally uh, focus on, we want to enable people to make decisions in terms of what can they plant or when should they plant? Should they diversify um, things like uh, do people need to order more vaccines for their livestock and so on? So in when we do this forecasting, we don't also just do as climate scientists. So we also have what is called the Greater Horn of Africa Climate Outlook Forum. So in this, we invite different stakeholders from different sectors. So we have food security, we have agriculture, livestock, media like you also <laughs> to thank help you, us thank in you for disseminating the information <laughs> thank you for helping me make an appearance yes in the forum yes and then through that process we go through co-production so co-production is a discussion between the scientists and also the users so that our information just doesn't die with in the us. archives in the shelves yes <laughs> with re with relation to um economic and financial security or empowerment how is climate affecting our economies how is climate affecting our bottom line and our bank balances because let's be honest climate action climate change as a topic can be very boring and most people really just want to get to the nuts and bolts of what is it actually costing me at a, at a financial level before we get into the food security level and of course the personal security level so linda gala maybe you can take that uh i think because it's very boring to city dwellers like like myself because the climate information for you is either to, is to decide on what outfit to wear. Yes, and if, yes. if the Uber is going to cost more, the Matachi <laughs> is going to raise their price. That's what we want to know. Yeah. But what we're beginning to see is an increase in extremes. And also, when we are talking about uh, pollution, for example, you're not looking at the impact on your health. Um, what does that, if uh, breakout, does, I think recently was a cholera outbreak. Yes. That is also because of the extremes that we see in flooding. So it impacts your health. And then most of our farmers rely on rain-fed agriculture. So your food is coming from people that rely on the rainfall to, to feed you. So when you have failed rainfall, then the especially in this economy, the price of food goes up. I heard there's actually a shortage recently of greens. And you know, I went into a panic because I'm a vegetarian. So usually I laugh at everybody. Ah, I don't need to buy any beef or chicken or whatever. Okay, you nothing. But when there was, I heard a greens shortage, panic ensued. So what I would understand, um, we know there's a problem. This may not be your particular field of expertise, but why are we not shifting from rain-led agriculture to other systems that we've seen in countries even like Israel, which is primarily desert? It's, it's economics. It's back to economics. And people can't afford to. Uh, the people who are farming our food, the small-scale farmers that have a tiny piece of land, many of them growing the mamambogas that... So they can't afford to set up an entire system to enable them to do things differently, which is why we talk about adaptation. But we can't just do adaptation. We have to include development. They need access to energy. They need access to better technology. We need to develop. We need to get to where Israel is. We need to get to where America is. But how can we do that in a way that um, does not 
contribute harm because the, how they did it is has caused the problems that we are they used fossil fuels to get to the place of development so you can't a lot of the reasons that we are where we are is because we can't afford to do it any differently so as much as you want to tell mamamboga to irrigate if she has a tank the best that we usually do is we get them a tank we tell you collect rain agriculture co collect rain when it rains from your rooftop but then if it doesn't rain for a significant amount of time then what what do they do i can't afford to set up an irrigation system i there are no loans for that i don't have the education for that we don't have access to technology you don't have even have energy access so then how do you do things differently so a lot of our problems are also developmental issues. So if we don't have the capacity to develop and develop differently, then we end up limited and we're helping people um, survive, but we're not helping them thrive. I like what you've brought up there, the issue of fossil fuels and uh, developing. And with me is Magdalene from Arc Rides. They are manufacturers of e-vehicles. And one of the things we've noticed is that we need to make a shift. Like we said, fossil fuels are contributing to the problem. These guys are helping with a potential solution. So tell me a little bit about the vehicles uh, that Arc Rides provides. So Arc Rides does a, range, a wide range of vehicles. We have electric two-wheelers, we have uh, electric bicycles, electric motorbikes, and we're also bringing in electric scooters, which will be very convenient for women. And soon we are going to bring electric three-wheelers, that is tuk-tuks. So the ones that we have here, we have the electric bicycle, which is a, it has a motor, which is powered by a battery. That's the best way to, to describe it. So this bike has three modes of operation. You can ride it as a normal mountain bike. You can also use the electric mode and you can also use it as the hybrid mode. So now the hybrid mode is a combination of the pedaling, the normal pedaling and the electric mode. Only that the motor pushes you. Now you pedal as you use the electric mode. So with the electric mode, you don't need to pedal. And how long does it last for on electric mode? In on terms electric of distance? mode, it will last you 50 kilometers full electric mode until you recharge again. And then it can go up to 50 kilometers per hour. That's amazing. You can yeah. move at 50 kilometers per hour on an e-bicycle. Yes, you can. Tell me now about the e-motorbike. The e-motorbike. So the e-motorbike has a motor and a battery. And that in a normal petrol bike, that would be the engine and the fuel tank. That is what has been replaced by the motor and the, uh, the battery. The battery. So this bike, it can take you up to 70 kilometers until you recharge again. And it can go up to 75 kilometers per hour. But I heard that uh, you don't actually recharge the battery. You actually swap the battery at a swap station for a fully charged battery. So actually save a lot of time not having to plug in the uh, motor e-motorbike and wait for it to charge. Yeah, that's the most convenient thing about our company. We are bringing in convenience. So we have swap stations around the cities and they are within a kilometer range from each other. So we equip our riders with an app. With that app, you can track, uh, you can see the map showing the swap stations next to you. And it can also show you the state of your bike, the state of your battery. It can tell you if your battery has a problem, if you are running low, and then you can go to the nearby swap station, which will, it, it doesn't, you don't need an attendant at the substation. You just do it by yourself and it takes you like two minutes, up to two minutes to swap. Excellent. We have uh, Magdalene from Arkride. We also have Maslin and Linda from McPack. More on Double O Direct after some Irene Cara who passed away on Thursday. The track, The Dream. Discussing how climate change negatively affects our finances, our food security, and our personal safety. With me, a Dr. Linda Ogalo and Dr. Maslin Gudoshava from IGAD, Climate Prediction and Application Center, ICPAC, and Magdalene Maluta from Arc Ride. A fantastic display of electric bikes here on Spice FM today. Mumbi, 
do a zoom. Do a zoom on the bikes. We got a bicycle that can actually take you up to about 50 kilometers on the motor. And we have an e-motor bike that can take you up to what, 70, 70 kilometers? 70 kilometers. That is incredible. Swap stations, you swap, swap in just about two minutes time. But I want to find out about you, Magdalene, because today I want to focus on women in STEM, women in sciences. And you're actually an engineer. Give yes, me a brief on your background and how you ended up at Arkwright. Uh before I came to Arkwright, I had lost my job to COVID. Uh, and then I was curious. My mind was, I need to find out something to do. I was on YouTube searching things. And then I was looking in, I, I would see Tesla e-mobility companies. And I'm like, this is something I can do. I can actually shift from mechanical engineering production option to automotive. Like it's not anything, it's not rocket science. And if it it's were. very rocket science, Mumbi and I are thinking, <laughs> yeah. what is she talking about? Yeah, but it's okay. You say it's not rocket science. I'll take your word for yeah, it. Yes, so it was something I I was considering, and then coincidentally, I got a call from Arkwright. Wait, wait. Did you apply, or they just called you? They called me. Okay, can we as women all take up engineering and STEM? Because you don't even have to go looking for a job. <laughs> the job comes looking for you. Continue, Magdalene. So they called me. They told me they are looking for women in engineering for if they needed they, they were just starting so Arkwright was founded in 2019 and then operations were starting in 2021 january and that's when they called me and then it was quite hard to get female engineers so i said yeah i can come in i get trained and then i see if i can do it but I was confident. I knew I could do it. I am so happy about all of this. I am so happy about all of this that is happening. You studied what in uh, university? A I, diploma? I did a diploma in mechanical engineering, production option. And with a NEC certificate. Do we know yes. what NEC stands for? Do any of you know what NEC stands for? NEC is Kenya National Examination Council. Okay, I yeah. love that. We're going to go off to one of our favorite people at the moment who's coming from Zimbabwe. <laughs> Tell me, Masalin, as a forecaster and working on climate action, what have been the primary successes of your work vis-a-vis -vis the challenges? Because you do short-term forecasting, you know, a day, a, a week, going into seasonal forecasting. But that can be quite challenging, especially in the region where ICPAC operates, because the people who are the primary beneficiaries are in the rural areas, not much access to technology, which would assist them in getting the information they so desperately require. So tell me a little bit more about that. Okay, so I think like you're saying, like access is one challenge that is there. But what ICPAC has been doing over the years is that we have been working with media. So at ICPAC, we actually have a communications team. And in that communications team, we have a variety of people. We have journalists, we have social scientists, and then we also have climate scientists. So we have had our um, um, communications team trying also to break down that information so that everyone is able to digest the forecasts that are being given and then we also have them engaging like at grassroots level going to counties disseminating that information explaining to people exactly what the forecast means and how they can actually interpret and make decisions based on that how detailed is it with regards to will it tell you exactly how many millimeters of rainfall will it tell you exactly how um strong the winds are going to be i mean how, how detailed is your forecasting <laughs> <laughs> 20 percent chance of rain like on my app you know <laughs> So now it really depends which one you are looking at. So when we are looking at weekly, we give it in terms of amounts, right? Like total amount. But then when we go to seasonal, because we are also looking like in terms of seasonal, you are looking at a very long lead time. So we don't give them as actual millimeters. We give it as in terms of probabilities. What is your chance of receiving above normal? What is your chance of receiving below normal rainfall? And then talking about what you have just said. So one thing that we would like to move to that we are trying to get into is um, impact-based forecasting. So in terms of instead of just saying you are going to receive 20 millimeters, you don't know what 20 millimeters means to the person. Uh, one time when I was attending a conference, they said, 
in Mozambique, there was a cyclone coming and then people were told you're going to receive over 200 millimeters overnight. Then the person who got that information just said, okay, it's 200 millimeters. And they went to bed. <laughs> then the following morning, <laughs> there were floods. Yes, yeah. yes. So instead of just giving that information to people, now we are trying to move on to saying 200 millimeters is going to do this to you. So yes. we are trying to give extra information. Yeah. That's brilliant. Uh, now to you, Dr. Linda Ogallo, PhD climate expert i'd like to <laughs> i'd like to understand uh what happened at cop because you were recently in uh, sharm el sheikh in uh, egypt yes and it wasn't your first it was your second cop it was my second cop so with regards to the institution which was started now we know 27 cycles ago which is 27 years ago so it um came in after egad but uh icpac came in after cop i want to understand what were your expectations and uh what are you feeling right now with regards to the results? Uh, because I've been in the climate field a bit longer, uh, I kind of manage my expectation. <laughs> <laughs> you were not impressed. <laughs> you were not impressed in the least. So <laughs> what really happens at, at COP? So we have countries, member states, So because we've talked about climate is impacting the environment. The world is warming at an alarming rate. And the reason why this is happening is because of fossil fuels. But you also have to realize that fossil fuels and uh, this emissions is a billion dollar industry. So you're basically going to tell people who rely or who make billions of dollars on fossil fuels and on industry and on, on, on fertilizers that you don't want them to do this anymore. If I was the one with a billion dollars and you told me that, I would give you money to adopt and keep polluting. I'd want to find a different way. Yes. So that's basically what countries do. You have the whole world, member states, coming together in one room and reaching negotiations on how can we do this better. And with different people with different interests, trying to see what's the best outcome forward. But then the challenge is, is you have this negotiations agreements that have been reached with no enforcement mechanisms. Mm. So it's goodwill. It's like going to court and the judge ordering you to do something and there's no police to enforce it. So you don't have to do you it. You may or may not. Yeah. It's up if to you. If you feel like it. Yeah. Yes. And the stakes are that those who have or those who are causing the problem are not being impacted by it bad enough to make a difference. And then those who, like us, have been impacted by it, we don't have uh, money on the table, so we are shouting and nobody's listening, nobody cares because we don't have the, uh, like those who control the past strings, so to speak, control what happens. Mm -hmm. So what was a uh, plus for us as African nations at this COP was that there was a mechanism for the first time to talk about compensation for the losses of climate change is what we call loss and damage. So that was a one win that at least Africa came out with that at least the Western countries agreed that um, they would set up a financial mechanism to enable us to get compensation for the losses that we're experiencing because of climate change. So that was a win. But on the other hand, it's it's a difficult problem that everybody wants to act like it's simple, but it's not as simple because again, it goes down back down to the pockets. Exactly. So it's, it's asking people to change and then there's no concrete solution in terms of how do we change. Uh, as much as we talk about renewable energies, solar, we don't have the, the technologies for the battery. Solar, the, there's no solar at night. And the batteries that we have are expensive. We talk about electrical vehicles. Uh, this is actually uh, an upcoming field, but how much does it cost to buy an, a new electrical vehicle? It's, it's over $10 million, for example, to get an, a, uh, an electrical vehicle. And then you can't buy it secondhand because the batteries get spoiled and then the cost of the dollars. batteries. 10 million shillings. 10 million shillings, yeah. yes. Okay. So the battery, yeah. almost changing the battery costs almost as much as buying the car. Yes. So the technology is not affordable. So the solutions that we have right now are still, still need investment. We need investment to know how to do it better. And we are not having the same conversation. If you talk about climate change in Africa, we, we are talking about we are dying now. 
If you go to the West, you talk about climate change, they're talking about we need to reduce emissions. You put us in a room, we all say climate change, and we assume we're having the same conversation. So there's a lot of challenges around we need to begin to redefine how we, what that what climate change means from the different perspectives, and we need to have a bit more grace to have honest conversations about um, the impact of asking people to change from a billion dollar industry and the frustration we have with having telling with them not wanting to change because if you struck oil right now if we struck oil in Kenya yeah right we were now, up there with the Tulo guys I was like front and center I was like hey their officers were down the uh, not down the street we're actually on Mombasa Road but you know in Westlands I knew where they were I was like these guys are about to get rich quick just now so if the Kenyan government had like would we tell them okay climate change don't don't tap into that leave it behind yes you'd, you'd have some people who yes of course are the activists but realistically would say we need roads we need to develop tap onto that oil so realistically if you were the one who was polluting and getting billion dollars from this you would have a completely different perspective. So I think that grace of, of, of looking at, yes, we need to change, but also understanding that this is not a simple conversation and also thinking how can we think collectively such that um, the, the losers are not losing as badly as they are right now because Africa is losing and we're losing badly. I have Art Cried and Ikpak joining us today. Tell me, after the very sad account given to us by Dr. Linda Ogallo, climate expert, PhD, mm -hmm. Ikpak, what can you as a representative from Art Cried so, share? Art stands for affordable, reliable and clean. So our bikes are quite affordable. We have partnered with financiers such as Watu Credit to make sure that the bike is can be bought by the local border border operators with higher purchase. And also it's reliable in we have soap stations around the city, so you don't have to struggle to charge. So you walk into a station, we own the ecosystem actually. So you don't have to worry about replacing the batteries. You don't have to worry about what if my battery is dead. We own the ecosystem. So you walk, you go to a soap station, you soap your battery, and you're sorted. You know how Kenyans, anything, we are last minuters. Let's be honest. Yeah. yeah? We're last minute. We, we know in Aisha, <laughs> and it's been on red. Yeah? yeah. But we're still hoping it could. Yeah. W would it be able to, could we call you for assistance? Yeah. We have, barabarani? we have a 24 7 tech team okay. on standby to help you if, in case you need help. But also, we have equipped our riders with an app an Arkwright app that you can monitor the state of your battery, the next, the, the nearby substation, like everything is sorted. Okay, yeah. going on to uh, Marceline Gudoshava, forecast expert. What, what was, what's your actual title? It's not forecast expert. No, no, tell me. Climate scientist. Okay, climate <laughs> scientist. We're going to go into that. Parting words? Uh, so my parting words is I think we have quite a lot of intelligent people out there. Uh, we have a lot. You wouldn't of know it from the state of our economy and the world in general, <laughs> but I'll take your word for it. <laughs> and for us to tackle issues with climate change, we need new innovations and new technologies. So I think we need to take it up to us as Africans to come up with those and solve our problems. I like that. I like that a lot. Dr. Linda Ogallo. Uh, I, I'm sad that I'm the bearer of doom. So I need <laughs> but you know, to redeem got myself. To be. Somebody's got to be. Let's be honest. I mean, out of four, right? It's not that. It's only a quarter. Yeah? No, but that smile makes up for it. And the fact that um, it's not doom for doom's sake. Mm -hmm. It's a warning. Yes, but also with every problem provides an opportunity for... Uh, Actually, every economic boom is a, a problem-solving opportunity. So you make money from people having problems that you have to solve. So there's a way for us to do it differently. And there's a way for us to, to make money or take advantage of. Like, uh, for example, the company that sh she's talking about would not be possible if this was not a problem. So for, for me, I went back to school. I'm back in school. I'm at Yale University. Ah, it's enough now with the education. <laughs> no, no, no. My mom's already texted me saying, can we adopt her? Can we absorb her into our family unit? I am done 
Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> have a good night. Just kidding. And you're back at Yale? Yes. Yeah, so I'm, I'm studying how to deploy and finance clean um, energy because I think the solution comes in having one access to energy for local communities and thinking about how do we pay for it differently. So I want to learn how to have different or new models of financial um, mechanisms to enable us to do things differently. How can we increase access to energy, especially for these local communities that need to move from subsistence farmers and do things like how you said in terms of how they do it, like Israel or, or um, in the Western world. So that's uh, my idea. Thanks to, um, I'm also now what they're calling a Three Cranes Fellow. Uh, who are paying for my education at Yale University, so I'm grateful for that. So I think there's an opportunity for us as as Africa, as uh, I think we have like 56% of Africans have access to power. That means there's a huge market that if you can be able to solve, bring them power, bring them energy, do things differently, then it's an opportunity for adaptation um, as a business, mitigation as a business, as and we, we have the biggest growing youth uh, youth bulge. And climate change and adaptation is still very untapped in terms of how do we solve the problem in a way that makes sense for us. So it's up to us to have African solutions to African problems that hopefully can benefit us as African people. Ladies, it's been an absolute pleasure. My take home is that STEM pays right? When all is said and done, STEM pays. Ladies, get into science, get your daughters into science, let them be engineers, scientists, mathematicians. They're called up for jobs. Companies are waiting to hire them, all right? Watch ICC Namumbi to find your radio, all right? And I'm just kidding. <laughs> Marceline, Linda, Manglin, thank you so much for joining me today on Double O Direct. Thanks thank for having you. us. I